Send it in the sea, the wind is blowing. Lights come on, the curtains rise. Pop, that's all we do, the acting. Better tell me who's right line. Gibberish. The first verses of that song may not be great poetry. I loved you from the time I met you. For me, you were the only one. Then I thought that you weren't honest and only teasing me for fun. So often you showed me I was wanted. I as cold as I could be. But at least they're not gibberish. And that strange fifth verse, I came that close to scratching it out because I had no idea what it meant. Until that is, I was sitting in an army library in Korea and I was reading a book by Carl Jung, the early psychoanalyst. In that book, Jung was talking about something that he called a collective unconscious. For Jung, the collective unconscious is sort of a distilled wisdom of humanity that we all share. Originally, Jung suggested that we inherit our collective unconscious through our genes. Much like birds and lizards get their instincts for gathering food without ever having been taught. However, Jung was always interested in the occult, it was the topic that he chose for his PhD dissertation, and his later writings reflect a belief in the mystical. That was especially true in papers and books that he wrote with his friend, Nobel laureate in physics, Wolfgang Pauli, and his psychological analyses of certain texts from Buddhism and Hinduism. In any case, it must have been in one of his later books that I was reading, for I do remember that he implied that we're all connected together in some manner in real time maybe even with lower life forms. A few weeks earlier, Sergeant M had seen me reading a book by Jung's teacher, Sigmund Freud. On that occasion, Sergeant M called out to the other nearby soldiers, Revis is reading a book by a guy named Frood. Well, after they had a coot with that, Sergeant M asked me, you don't really believe that shock, do you? I told him, not much, but some of the ideas are kind of interesting. And that's pretty much how I felt about Jung. Jung's ideas were just too similar to what I saw as superstitious religious beliefs. Ideas about the holy ghosts and all that sort of stuff, but I had recently abandoned in favor of atheism. Interesting, but not very believable. So I'm skimming over the pages, not reading very carefully, when all at once I came to a passage that made me sit up and focus. In that passage, Jung was discussing what he called archetypes. Archetypes, he claimed, were the prototypical images and concepts that were the main content of the collective unconscious. The archetypes, he went on to say, were to be discovered in dreams and legends and myths. And he proceeded to give many examples of legends from a variety of cultures, showing the remarkable similarity of their imagery, even from cultures that surely could not have borrowed from one another. But what suddenly jolted me was his discussion of a pair of images, the sun and the sea. The sun, he explained, represents the male, and the sea represents the female. Oh, so that's what my fifth verse meant. Sun in the sea, the wind is blowing. Like a boy, the and dry. Pop, that's all we do, the acting. Better tell me who's right lines. After he explained it, I could not doubt his interpretation. My fifth verse obviously was about procreation, just as Jung had claimed. Even though his interpretation was undeniably on target, I still doubted his explanation, the instinct explanation I could have believed, but I found it improbable that we're all connected together by some kind of collective unconscious in real time. I was willing to admit that the electrical activity of the brain no doubt produced electrical fields surrounding the head, 
for I had been reading electronics and physics books ever since my Uncle Perry gave me that crystal set up on the 10th birthday. The problem I had with Jung's explanation was that those fields surely would be too weak to influence the electrical activity occurring in the brains of other people. Surely there could be no collective unconscious, no huge field connecting everybody, right? Shortly after I read Jung, I had a remarkable experience that challenged my skepticism regarding the notion of the collective unconscious that is more than mere instinct. While taking my usual Sunday afternoon nap one crisp day in the fall of 1959, I felt an urge to take one last hike in those beloved Korean hills before returning to the U.S. So I jumped out of the bunk, threw on my insulated jacket, signed out of the orderly room, headed out the gate, down the road, to a beautiful hill path that I often had walked. That hill was high enough so that I could see over several ranges of hills to the west, so I was climbing high up in the hill when, perhaps an hour later, I realized that it must be almost time for the sun to set. I felt a brief panic, for in those days, so soon after the end of the Korean War, with few electric lights, even in the big city of Seoul, some thirty miles to the south, when the sun went down it was dark. Even with the clear sky that I had on that cold afternoon, it would be tricky navigating my way down the steep path in the dark. So I glanced back to check the position of the sun, and the view that met my gaze was so otherworldly beautiful that I fully turned around just to bathe my mind in the beauty. I saw range after range of hills. The colors of the hills in the foreground were brown with splotches of green vegetation. Beyond that the hills were deep purple, and those that were far away were pink, and above them all the fiery sun surrounded by a blue sky with an orange haze near the horizon. As I was soaking in the beauty, suddenly everything started getting brighter. I thought, oh no, they've dropped the atomic bomb on us. Recent army training had taught me to, one, look around to see which direction the light was coming from, and two, dive behind a boulder or a tree to shield my body from the radiation. So I quickly looked around, but it seemed that the light was equally bright in all directions. And then the light swiftly became so intensely white that I could no longer see anything. After a few seconds of blindness, a new scene began to unfold, and I realized I was several yards directly over the ridge of a house, and then I really panicked. While trying to plan whether to attempt to roll forward on the side of the roof facing the road, or down the other side of the ridge toward the backyard, I realized I wasn't falling. My panic subsided, and I looked around, wondering where I was. I looked down again at the roof, this time more carefully. And just as I had thought, it really was an asphalt shingle roof with red shingles. I mentally reviewed the buildings that I had seen in my three months of travel in Japan and my even more extensive trips during my more than a year of time in Korea, and I couldn't remember ever having seen asphalt shingles anywhere in the Far East. Then I saw a car, a big car made in the USA, lumbering down the road in front of the row of houses that were beneath me. I concluded that I was surely back in the USA. I looked around a little more and saw that across the street there was a row of little trees, and beyond that, a large open field. Then I noticed three kids playing across the street, two boys and a girl. Even though that little girl's golden hair was impressive, I don't remember thinking that she was especially good-looking. Nevertheless, I suddenly felt welling up within me an excruciatingly powerful craving for that girl, a craving so strong that it seemed that it would turn me inside out. While I was watching, she jumped up, attempting to grab a branch on one of the little trees, but her grip failed and she fell back. The boys then put their hands on her waist and she jumped up again as the boys hoisted her up and I'm screaming irrationally, Get your mitts off my girl! Get your mitts off my girl! at the top of my lungs. They completely ignored me, and of course I realized immediately that I had no lungs. Or maybe they still existed but were parked back on that hillside with the rest of my body in Korea. Puzzled, I began to reflect upon this weird scene that I was in. It didn't take long to recognize the hand of my guardian angel, once again interfering with my life. I thought I can go halfway around the world and get away from my parents, but how do I get away from this meddling guardian angel? I got angry. I started shouting at my guardian angel, I'm no pedophile! And anyway, I'm a level-headed atheist, and I don't even believe in visions. Quickly, I was again engulfed in whiteness, and I re-entered my body. My knees buckled, and I had to react quickly in order to remain upright. Then the whiteness faded, and I could again see the Korean sunset. 
I found this experience unnerving partly because, after all, an out-of-body experience is another order of weirdness beyond my guardian angels teaching me Kriya Yoga. But worse yet, because it reminded me of an incident that happened a couple of years before while riding to classes at Kansas City Junior College. Sometimes the other four guys in the car and I passed the time during our 40-minute commute by playing checkers. I easily could beat any of them except for one fellow who had a strange way of playing, whereas I took a long time to make my move while I visualized the consequences of moving each of my checkers that were in play. After I made my move, he'd merely glance at the board and move within maybe five, ten seconds. The first time he did that, I thought, he's going to be a pushover. Well, was I surprised? Somehow he consistently beat me half the time, the only guy in the car who could really challenge me. Finally, I asked him how he did it. He said simply, intuition. Intuition? It was difficult for me to believe that his intuition could equal my reason. But his success spoke for itself. One day this intuitive guy said something very peculiar. He said that sometime in the future I'd meet a girl, a girl I'd fall so in love with that it would more or less drive me crazy. He said that she would have very blonde hair. One of the other guys asked if I thought that that could happen. After a long moment of introspection, I answered, yes. Having experienced the frightening intensity of my craving for that girl with the gold in here, I was worried that somewhere in the U.S. there would be a girl that I would succumb to as if in a spell. A terrifying prospect, given my recent decision to see if I could find a wife outside the U.S., maybe Korea or Mexico. Nevertheless, I wouldn't give up my decision to search for a foreign wife. When my company commander told me I wouldn't be permitted to be discharged in Korea and had to return to the U.S., I settled on Mexico. Somehow my guardian angel knew of my decision and had gone into action against it. Had he foreseen the sad consequences of my decision? And might he have been able to whisk my consciousness from that Korean hillside back to the U.S.? Because he, I, the future, and all of what we call reality or within an all-embracing consciousness, something like Jung's collective unconscious? I began to think of Jung's explanation as rather more credible than mere speculation. This experience challenged me to think more deeply into the kind of thing that Jung was talking about. I thought my best bet to understand this was to learn more about Eastern philosophy and physics. I knew that Eastern philosophy was the preferred orientation of many physicists who, I hope, would provide an interpretation of what Eastern sages were talking about that would fit within my atheism. And what was it that sparked such hope? Five, four, three, two, one. Like many young kids, I was fascinated with physics and physicists. 